history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take sort of extreme positions on it, right? But I'm going to tell the history as though it happened in the reverse, okay? So that black people are on top and white people are on the bottom. That's going to be the change in household wealth. Well, maybe because they didn't probably invest in Bitcoin, because you probably can do, I mean... They didn't invest in Bitcoin. They didn't, they didn't invest wherever they need to invest. They didn't do the smart things that y'all did, right? The civil rights movement was nonviolent, y'all. They were walking across the bridges arm in arm in solidarity. And you brought the dogs out and the fire hoses out. Could you take a little bit of responsibility for it? Could you just take a little bit, maybe? Just a tiny bit that maybe some of who you are today is only because of what they are not? Did you ever, can you think about that? All right, ma'am. So today we're going to talk about, have a conversation about responsibility. And not, just kind of an open conversation. I want to go in some different directions today to see where we go, see how we do it, see what, what it's all about. But first I need a couple of volunteers. Two are probably fine, and here's who I need. Um, I need a couple of people who remember last class. That was the, the one where we did the, the switching of roles, right? Switching of history. I told history from a different direction. And I want someone who remembers enough of that, or not the details of it, right? But for whom it had enough of an impact that you actually would have an opinion about what it is that I was trying to do. So I need someone who's got a, who really can remember and can say something. I need two people. So, Fernando? Carly. Carly, Fernando. Okay, what, to the best of your kind of sense of things, what is it that you think I was trying to do? Um, you basically summarize it at the end, how all this oppression has been going on for years and years, and even today, we're st minorities are still being disfranchised, oppressed, and you're just amazed at why aren't we doing enough or even acknowledging that it's still going on and we're not uprising, we're not criticizing the system that we are just idle in. Just what, do, what do you mean by oppressed? Um, and oppressed as in we still have this connotation of success is the white picket fence in the suburbs with white uh -huh. features and all this, you know, not our ethnic features mm hmm yeah okay Carly right yes all right I think you wanted to like open the conversation and get everybody to start talking about it more I feel like if that if white people were in the same place as black people we would be constantly talking about it maybe not if we were the minority in numbers in the country but I feel like it would be viewed as like a completely different realm if that happened to our ancestors we would constantly be asking for more be like Demanding more, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So how did how okay? So how did that sit with you as a white person? So I'm a big feminist, so I can see like how it it, it kind of sucks to be the subordinate in society. So mm -hmm. and like I'm in a lot of like diverse communications class. I was that journalism major that you said wasn't. It, I don't know, like an econ, but we talk about diversity a lot and how like the dominance in society feels like they need to oppress like the subordinate people. So uh -huh. it kind of resonated with me a lot, especially like the forms that are in place for white Americans of privilege and how we view people of poverty now. We see them as like people that aren't willing to try and just aren't working hard enough, even though like after World War II and the white, like the GI Bill, we saw, we viewed white people as just people that weren't being helped enough by their country. Mm -hmm. All right, bro, how, how, how do you think most white, how do you think the average white person would take that, take that lecture? You know, for example, remember I said that half of all people of, in this, in the, in the example, it was half of all black people think that white people, that they have it worse than white people, right? Because when I reversed it. So in reality, what we see in the world is about half of all, in the U.S. today, about half of all white Americans have a sense that it's worse for them in the U.S. today than it is for black and brown Americans. Like we are oppressed, oppressed to use your word, more than black and brown people. 
So well, how do you, given that, how do you think the message would be heard by white people? Um, basically, uh, the, as minorities, we are growing ever slightly, but at the same time, that power that's already been established for hundreds of years by whites, as soon as it starts to dip and they feel like, oh, it's getting a little dark in here, they're automatically gonna assume like, hey, like, we're being oppressed, we are the ones. But that's the generation that is there, you know? They had nothing to do with that, in fact, from the past with slavery and Jim Crow. Uh -huh. But those systems are still in place and they've been there for centuries. Mm -hmm. So it's to them, like, we are the victim because of our forefathers, uh -huh. even though they had nothing to do. But I think they have to realize, like, we are, our forefathers were hurt too, and we were in a negative situation. Like, yes, life isn't perfect. We're not all great people, but the past still influences the present, and okay. that's what we need to okay. fix. So, um, what do you think more white people that feel like we're beyond race and we shouldn't be talking about race, what would they say about that lecture? I think they would kind of laugh at it, most of them, but I come from a really conservative state where people like won't really change their opinions. So, but maybe if they were able to like empathize with the other side, they would realize that it kind of sucks to be the subordinate group in society. Or, or maybe, maybe not so much that it sucks, but that there's, that there's a reason that people respond in the way that they do that maybe they don't see. Yeah, that right. they're so defiant to like uh -huh. just be quiet now. Right, there are things going on. Yeah. Right. So this is, I think, what Fernando, you were getting at. That there are things that are happening that we don't necessarily see. And when these things happen, we, you know, we, we don't pay attention, right? Nobody really, there's so much of the world about which we don't pay attention and we don't really know, and because we're busy. I don't know what we're busy doing, watching sports or who knows, I don't know what we're doing. We're busy living our lives, trying to keep our head above, trying to pay our tuition bill at Penn State where tuition keeps going up. And like one thing after another, right? Trying to not get pulled over by the police. I don't know what we're trying to do, right? So, uh, but in that way, there's this kind of sense that if we're not paying attention to those, but some people are paying attention. And then some people are pointing this out. And if we're not paying attention, it seems like those people are in the wrong, right? Which is what you're saying, because they should be seeing the world like I do. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add, bro, before we move on? Basically, like, I think all it takes is just someone to take some time and just put on other people's shoes for a second and just see from a different perspective. All right, yeah. put on somebody else's shoes and see it from a different perspective. With that in mind, let's transition to our next activity. Thanks, Mom. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So now I need three volunteers, and I need three people of, who trace their ancestry to slavery. So you could be from the Caribbean, or you could be African American. It doesn't really matter. Um, what's your name and what's your family history really fast? Um, my name is Eric. Um, I'm from Philly. But that's where my parents were born. But in slavery, we traced back to Virginia. To Virginia? So this is like the real deal. Yeah. Do you have anyone, has, have people really traced it back? Yes. Really? How far back? Well, f far back from, in terms of West Africa. No, um, not that far. Oh, okay, okay. Basically, just from Virginia. Yeah? Yeah. All right, cool. So, Eric. Hey, I'm Marisol. Marisol? Yeah. Marisol? Marisol, see. Sí. From Honduras. Uh-huh. And you're really from Honduras? Yeah. So Honduras had a slave port Yeah, they also. did. Mm -hmm. I'm actually from that port. Yeah? Yeah. Trujillo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And so you were born there. And Mar you live here now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. And do you talk, so you talk about slavery a lot, probably. Yeah. I mean, it was a shipwreck. So we weren't actually slaves, but yeah. we were on our way to slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yes, ma'am. My name is Mia. Um, Mia? Mia. <clears throat> my family's from North Carolina, where my great-grandmother actually still lives on the plantation that she was raised in. Seriously? Yeah. We took our slave owner's last name, and we live in Styron Town, and our last name was Styron. What, what's your last name? 
our last name, well, my last name, not anymore, was Styron. We took that from our slave owners, and we live in Styron Town, North Whoa. Carolina. Yeah, that's intense. Okay, so it's M Maya, Mia. Mia, Marisol, Eric. All right, man, so here, first off. Her, yeah, you can have it now. Well, you can just. So I'm going to give you the gift of some chocolate, Marisol. ¿Habla español? Muy bien. Okay, so. Are we ready? You can, we're going to turn the table around a little bit so you can watch this video. Bro, are you going to play it on the right screen or the left? Right? This one? Perfect. Even better. So you can. Just sit on this side of the table, and then when we're done, we'll sit on the other side. So we're going to watch a video here uh, quickly. So I have a colleague who... Uh, I've known for quite a number of years, who is the, one of the original kind of leaders in exposing modern day slavery to the world and talking about it. Slavery's never gone away. We've always had slavery. We'll always, you know, it's, it's here today. Uh, he is the one who uh, helped to move forward to inspire producing this film, his work. Uh, he's been in this classroom a number of times. He's one of the foremost researchers and people studying slavery in the world. Um, and, the, and again, the first one who started talking about chocolate. And one thing that he said that has always stuck with me is that the, Nate, the way cocoa is produced in the world, is picked, it's sent to, um, sent to the market, is it all gets mixed together. And the Ivory Coast is responsible for about, you know, I think 40% of the world's chocolate. And so um, what happens is it, it all gets sent into, mixed in together. And he said, it's almost a guarantee that when you buy chocolate that is not slave, uh, free trade chocolate and slave free chocolate, it's almost a guarantee that it has traces of slave produced chocolate in it. So it has chocolate that was picked by um, um, young men and uh, who, such as these, okay? Just almost a, a guarantee, right? And there are lots of other pieces to this as well that we could talk about, but right now I wanna just stick with the chocolate. So my, so that means that the chocolate that I have here has slave produced chocolate in it, okay? So people have died producing this chocolate, okay? For sure. And, but now we have to have another piece because we had the first piece and now, and you enjoyed it, right? It was good? You still have it or did you eat it? I still have it. You still have it? Oh, well now you gotta finish it. Well, I think you have to. Seems to me that you have to. I mean, you don't have to if you think that you're never going to eat chocolate again that's slave free, then you're probably fine, but otherwise. So, but any, if you can turn the mics on, because I have a couple questions for you. Um, so one of you, um, just, yeah, just grab the mic. Uh, so for one of you, whoever, um, how much do you know about this? I knew that the slavery like this existed. I just didn't, I just found out about this specific situation right now. Uh-huh. How about Marisol? Um, I knew about uh, free trade chocolate and like why that's a thing and why people try to buy that over just regular chocolate, but I know that's also really hard to find. Uh-huh. Because of Mia, slavery. how about, no, go ahead. Yeah, because of the slavery. Uh-huh. Mia, how about you? What do you, how much do you know or what do you know and? I've only heard about slaves in like the mass production of cheaper clothing. I've never heard about it um, making chocolate. I've only heard of the production of chocolate at the Hershey factory. Uh -huh. This is new. So what in, we, just as a, out of curiosity, what do you think has kept you from learning about it? 
the three, any, any of you, like, what do you, what, just out of complete curiosity, what do you think has kept you from learning more about it in your, a year, how, how old are you? Eight, 18? 19? 20? 18? 21. 21. In your 18, 20, and 21 years, what, what, what do you think has kept you from learning more about it? It's probably mostly ignorance. I don't really think Hang about on. it. Hold the mic close. Oh. It's probably mostly ignorance. I don't think about it when I reach for a chocolate bar, like how was this made or where did it originate? Uh huh. Yeah. So ignorance and Eric, how about you? Um, I would definitely say ignorance plays a big part of it. Not from the willingness not to know, but I pay attention to what, what happens in the media all the time. I watch the news, especially when back home, like every single day. And I kind of like, a lot of people only talk about what they know. And uh -huh. when you don't see something, you don't feel like feel the reason to go and look something up. But, and that's how a lot of people don't realize situations like this happen every single day. Uh-huh. Marisol, how about you? Same thing, or do you have something more to add? Yeah, I want to say it's ignorance, but a uh, funny story. I actually learned about this chocolate slavery in a cast class here at Penn State. Um, one of the speeches you have to kind of write about a pressing issue, and a girl actually did write about this, and she uh, also gave a list of all like free trade chocolate to kind of, yeah. yeah, so. And you, did that stop you from eating chocolate? Not really, but I'm not a big chocolate eater. But, but I eat definitely forget about it when I'm like in a store and I'm eating chocolate, yeah. Uh-huh. So what keeps you from learning more? Just out of... What do you think keeps you from learning more? What keeps you... What allows you to forget? Like, what, you know what I mean? Like, what's that? Probably my environment. Yeah. Um, everyone around me loves chocolate. Every store or bodega has chocolate. Uh -huh. It's all Hershey's, Snickers, yeah, uh, et cetera, and yeah. So, do you have? Do either one of you want to add something to that? What keeps you from learning more and discovering? And I just think that a lot of people, especially me, at times, live with this idea that, like, they'll see it in the news, they'll see it in the media. That if I can't help now, it's kind of like, a, oh well. Like, if well, I can't do anything. I'm just here, and I feel as though that holds a lot of people back from making change. Uh huh. So I, so I have a question then, I, I, here's one. What do you think you're, okay, so ignorance, um, you know, it's just like you're around people who aren't thinking about it, you're just kind of going through your day, it's like it's just not in your face, it's not part of it, it's like, you know, you just, it's kind of easy to forget, in your case, Marisol, right? Like, um, you all trace your ancestors to slavery. So I'm curious about what your ancestors would say about those answers. I don't think they'd find it acceptable at all. Uh-huh. Yeah, I what think, do you think they might say? I think, like I said, they would find it unacceptable. They would be like, you know what we had to go through. How do you think that's fair or that's right that you're putting someone through the same thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Eric, how about you? I'm thinking about slavery in Virginia, right? Like, I'm thinking about all the, the photos that I've seen. I mean, I have a real sense. And yeah, um, especially, I still have a lot of members that live in, like, a lot of family members that live in Virginia. And I think they will all kind of, like, be pissed that you being, like, your family comes from slavery. Why aren't you trying to go and do more to learn about that and learn the different types of slavery? It's kind of like, even though I'm obviously, I wasn't a slave, but I feel as though I just have a social responsibility being a black individual to learn about that. And the fact that mm -hmm. I didn't now, they would, kind of, they would definitely be ashamed of that. Yeah. Marisol, do you have anything to add to that? I agree. With yeah. Those. So, um, so can, can you go to the next? Hey, by the way, that, the little girl there, that's the daughter of uh, my Afghan partner, uh, my partner in Afghanistan on a project that we have. And I w took that in, we were in Mumbai last December. Isn't she cute, right? So, uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, you know, the State Department estimates there are about 
um, 200,000 slaves working in the Ivory Coast, right? So we know 40% of the world's cocoa. Um, the, the, the global slavery index, you know, drops that. But that's a lot, right? That's a lot. I mean, that's really producing a lot of, of cocoa for the world. So, um, but go to the next slide. So fair, um, fair trade chocolate. Um, So, um, so here's a question I have. Do, do, you, do, you, do you all see where I'm going here? By the way, are there any... What do you say to white people who don't really pay attention to race issues and some of the stuff that, you, that, you know, people of African ancestry go through in the United States and other places. And they don't really pay attention because, you know, they're busy doing other things. And the people around them aren't really paying attention. And it's like, ah, you know, I care, but I, you know, like, I don't know, I forget. I, I don't know. It's kind of ignorance. I'm busy. I don't, what, do you, what, do you, what, what do you hear black people saying? Just maybe not you, but what do you hear black people saying to them? Just let, let her, go ahead, Marisol. What do, what do black people say to those white people? They're like, yeah, man, it doesn't really affect me. I don't know, I'm kind of busy. I, I can't. Um, for one, that they're ignorant. Uh-huh. Um, that because this isn't part of their experience, they're not forced to kind of leave their own world and try and fix things, even though they have to realize that they're superiors, so they actually have the power. Uh-huh. What else? I hear a lot of must be nices and like that's the power of privilege that you can forget. I hear a lot of race issues are American issues. You should care. Yeah, r race issues are American issues. We should all care. Bro, how about you? What if some people, you're from Philly? Mm -hmm. Dude, what, come on, get, be real. Like, come on, like, let it rip for a second. What do you hear some people saying? Well, I do hear a lot of people say that this doesn't affect me, but I feel as though no matter what race you are, no matter if it's racism and sexism, because we live in such an integrated nation, it affects everybody no matter if you're going through it or not. Because if it's not you going through it, what is it that you're not doing that could change? Or what is it that you are doing that could change the outpack, the outlook that other people in the press groups, non-privileged groups have in America, and most importantly throughout the entire world? Mm -hmm. So. Um, those of you in class who are white, especially those of you who think I'm too liberal and that maybe I've not, I don't know, that maybe you feel like I'm kind of coming down on white people a little bit too hard. Those of you, right? Are we cool? And maybe, Jeff, I don't know, are the, the alt-right people who are trolling us, are they watching the stream right now? All right. So, uh, they, they only watch like little bits of you taken out of context. Okay, like listen, alt-right people, make sure you watch this, okay? Because, look, basically what I've done is I've taken the shoes off of white people who are saying I'm really kind of, I don't know, it's just not my life, it's I'm busy. I've taken those off and I put, put them on you all right here. Right? And it's what F Fernando said earlier. It's like empathy, right? Like the last class was about trying to put yourself in the shoe. I was trying to get you in to get, go into the shoes of another person to say like, wow, what would it be like if I was them, right? If this stuff happened to white people, how would white, how would me as a white person react? Probably very similar to the way black and brown people have reacted. And so like, oh, okay, I can get it. So now you all, right, you have this opportunity to say, wow, here, this is really the same. In some ways it's worse, right? Because we're not talking about, Eric, you going into Target downtown and somebody following you around but not following your right friend the security guard, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, that's a problem. But yo, man, that's not like being enslaved. You know what I mean? So like, that's a, we're, we're in a different world here. So you all now have suddenly have the, and they have the opportunity to say, wow, this is kind of how it is for white people. We live in this world and we're like, yeah, I'm, I know, but I'm just living my life. I'm trying to be a good person. Are you all good people, right? You do nice things for people. You're all good people, right? Of course. So you're, be, you're good people. There's nothing wrong with you. You're trying to do the right thing and like, whoa, shit. 
Can I add? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just think that a lot of people, everybody has something to complain about in life, but I think a lot of people don't realize that in another part of the world, there's somebody that probably has a more fucked up situation than you do, and I feel as though a lot of people don't realize that. Mm. Yeah, 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 totally, man. Well, one of the things of this class is to see, show all the ways in which we're connected. And so, you know, this is one way, right? And by the way, I just want to point out, I also want to say something to those of you who have a maybe question whether I'm really fair, fair, I treat white people fairly in here. Dude, I would, I, I beg of you to go find a single example that you can find on the web, please. And I'm not talking like Fox News and Sean Hannity and so on. I'm talking about a reasonable human being with a thoughtful analysis who would go out and take three black people and put them on the spot in the way that I just did. In the way that I just did. And I'm doing right now. I'm basically saying to black people, y'all, listen. Let me hold this mirror right up to your face here. Next time you have any thoughts about white racists and white people and white this and white that, just the fingers going out this way and three are coming back at you, as Gandhi said. And so those of you who have this, who are sitting through this class and feeling like, man, I'm not treating white people fairly, I, I ask you to go find somebody who would do that. Talk about being fair. Are you kidding me? Nobody, no white person in their right mind would do that. And I'm doing it. And that's the fairness in here. Is that cool? You got that? Because I think that's real, man. But I'm not doing it to, I'm not really putting you on, what I'm doing is offering everyone the opportunity to see that there are ways in which we're all the same. I'm busy. You know, I eat fair trade chocolate, by the way. Y'all, I brought... Three bars. One bar is uh, organic lemon ginger, two are, and one is, and they're all dark chocolate. Yo, man, the lemon ginger is the best, but you can have the first pick. Straight up. That's fair trade chocolate. That's the best chocolate in the world. My wife and I buy it by the case. So we are chocolate common, common sewers. Not connoisseurs, we're common sewers of chocolate. <laughs> so, listen, man. Uh, so here's what I want to say. A couple things about, let me throw a couple things out. First, fair trade. Let me lay out the fair trade thing really fast. Fair trade simply means that everybody throughout the production line gets a fair price for what they do. So whether you're selling the seeds or the fertilizers or, or irrigating the fields or own the fields or pick or whatever it is, everyone gets a fair, they, a livable way. You know, it's not, I mean, it's not across the board, obviously. We're talking places, you know, like Ghana and Mali and so on or Ecuador or wherever. But nonetheless, we try to do that and that's fair trade. So maybe you pay a little more. But... You don't pay that much more. Those were, those, I, we paid, I think, $2.50 for those bars of chocolate. So that's cheaper than a bar of Hershey's. Um, so what can people do? Somebody asks on the live stream, like, okay, so what can people do? We can get involved, man. There are several student organizations here on campus that are addressing issues of, of uh, uh, fair trade issues and labor and so on. So you get involved. We can't get involved with everything, but those of you who want to get involved, get involved. Here, go to the next slide. Um, do you know anything about this? You ever heard of Coal Town? Do you know Coal Town? Do you know what Coal Town is? Do you know what Coal Town is? Do you know what it is? Do you know? How many know? How many know? Wow. Seriously? Listen, man. Anybody? Someone say something? One person. Did one. Damn. So listen. So here, anyone know the history of the D DRC? Anybody? Man, so look, yeah? Okay, so look, th since 1996, it's an estimate, and we don't even know, so many people died, 3.5 million to 5.4 million people died. 
That's just how many died. Not displaced, not harmed. I mean, the stories upon stories. This has basically been an ongoing civil war genocide for I don't know how long. Okay? It's, I, I'm not, I shouldn't call it a genocide because truthfully it's not. But, okay. What? $24 trillion worth of precious minerals exist in Congo. And the DRC. An estimated $24 trillion. So, cobalt, 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 diamonds, gold, and coltan. And coltan is a heat-resistant mineral. It's really important. It's an element, heat-resistant element, that, that we use in motherboards and, and phones and so on and so forth, right? And so it's really, but it has, it has tantalum in it. And tantalum is this key element that resists heat, okay? So everyone's fighting over it. So we see these wars that are going on for cobalt. So listen, who's got, or coltan, I mean. So, I don't know, dude. Everyone, anyone not have a phone in here? It's like, every phone has coltan in it. Every phone. And one of the worst atrocities in the modern age, in the 20th century, is happening in Congo, and it's still happening, right? In slavery, and killing, and death. The UN, the UN called, three years ago, the United Nations called the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, the rape capital of the world. The rape capital of the world. All driven, mostly driven, by the elements that we all have in our cell phones. And we're all part of this. And so the question for this class is, who's responsible? How much responsibility do we have? Like, we're, I don't know, have the answers. You know what I mean? I don't have the answers. But it's like, this just happens to be another sub-Saharan African country. But most slaves in the world today are actually in India. So not, they're, they're I don't have the answers. But, you know, here's another one. Right? What do we do? Damn. Good. Next one. Um, you know, here's one. Right? Nestle, Hershey, and Mars. So they, they, they agreed that by 2015, this is, I'm just going to throw this out to you all, right? I want to just keep it out there since we're on sweets, right? They agreed that by 2015, they would stop sourcing palm oil from deforested lands. So this is a land, this happens to be in Indonesia. It's about a, a a parcel of land, it's like 3.7 million hectares of land that was the home of orangutans, tigers, elephants, and so on, right? Not anymore. And they have made very, very little progress. And so when you see these activists who are out there sort of pushing things and pushing things and pushing things, right? Then this is part of what it is. And it's not difficult to get involved. I can't tell anyone what to do. All you got to do is just look and get involved. But how responsible are we? Dude, each one of you, right? How, how responsible are we? How responsible, here's your phone, right? I have my phone. How responsible are we? I don't not have a phone. I have a phone. How responsible am I? Where are we? This is the thing. And in this class, once we start talking about race, and you know, we start looking at one group. Let's say we talk about gender in here, and we start kind of, I don't know, it's this thing. We all have to be part of this, and we are part of it. And we all benefit from all the, the destruction. Like, we benefit. My God. And we don't benefit. We're all harmed by creating these systems that are just really brutal. It can't be good. I don't know. Do you have a... a, a you, the three of you get some final responses and then you can sit down and eat your chocolate. Guilt-free, by the way. What would you like to say? Okay, do you have a response? Do you have a final response? Bro. I would just like to say that even though I'm not directly linked to what happens in the DRC, I feel as though m most people that are accountable and m have more accountability are the people that know what's going on but can't like speak on it or choose not to speak on it because it doesn't directly impact them. Yeah, but it doesn't, right, that's right. But it doesn't mean if we don't know about it, we, you know, just because we don't know about it doesn't mean we're not accountable at some level, right? Yeah, I don't know what level that is. Like, I have no idea. I don't know. Like, my God. Marisol, do you want to add? Mia? 
I was just going to say, I like being called out for my ignorance. It makes me feel more accountable. Why not do the research? Why not know? Why not tell somebody else? Yeah. 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 Uh, capping on what they both said, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, also, I think it's important to um, make sure that the people in power know what they're doing wrong and right. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, can I, I want to say something else. Thanks for that. Those are thoughtful responses. But while you're still here, I want to say something again to white people, especially the white people, which is probably not most of you, but some of you, and certainly your parents, but who think, who have this idea that somehow it's worse for us than it is for other people. I want to say that we create stories. The dominant group, it's not just about white people. It's men, it's rich people, it's whatever the case is. We create, make sure you turn your phones off, by the way. Uh, we create stories that allow us to not feel like that kind of sense of accountability, the sense that we're responsible, the sense whatever. So, you know, the, the race switch thing that we did the other day. So imagine that, I don't know, it's like, you know, what happens in the world, here, let me say it this way. What happens in the world of race is black and brown people are always bringing, or not always, but often bringing to our attention the inequities. Like women are right now picking up and having these conversations and forcing all of us to have to think about these issues. So they bring it to the table. But in bringing it to the table, it, we can create a story, we, and we do create a story, as though like, well, and with, just with race, black and brown people don't ever address these issues and they don't think about this and like they're just blaming white people. And what I see is that that's not the case. I rarely see that being the case. So just like the, the responses from the three of you, I, what I experience mostly from black and brown people is like they're not just blaming white people. It's like they're just bringing the, the issues to, onto the table so we can all look at it. And so, I like your, an your answers are thoughtful. That's generally what I see. But white people, we create the story. We want to just sip, if we can just say, hey, black people and Latinos and so on, they're just blaming white people. That allows us then to not have to actually look at what's going on. And so it's just like, oh yeah, I can just close my ears then. Just screw you. You're just trying to blame me for these problems. Dio. That's gold right there, man. All right, thanks, dog. Do you need to, yeah. do you want to wipe your hands? You can go wipe your hands off in the back. Thanks, man. By the way, that's like really, that's really intense for the three of them to come up here and, and, do, and put them, be on the spot like that, really. Because it it's like really intense. Because basically, it's, I just sort of, it's like being just shown, just being shown ignorance. But dude, by a middle-aged white guy, you know what I mean? I mean, what the, f a mid how is it that you get through life and it's a middle-aged white guy that's going to like call you out on something that you don't know, that probably you should know. How many, dude, how many, I don't know, Black people in here are Eagles fans, and you're going to be, oh, I'm following the Eagles, and I'm, I'm read the statistics, and I read all the sports pages, and I watch all the shows, and I'm anxiously clicking through ESPN, and want to make sure the Eagles, you know, do well, and who's going to, how's the quarterback going to do, and what's going to happen, and so on and so forth. And you can't even take three minutes to read about Colton or slavery. It's like there's more slavery in the world today than at any point in human history. So we got plenty of time for all these other things, but eh, we don't have time for that. Really? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? There are lots of things I don't know about and I'm ignorant of and because I, I don't take the time. Because I don't know, I'm busy. I'm scrolling through Reddit or something. I don't know. Do y'all do have some, do you, I, do you have some questions? Does anyone want to say anything? How many, how many have a question? You'd like to put something out there. Uh, how do you square the cost with cheaper chocolate that may be made from slaves than maybe more expensive chocolate? Because that's probably not the only chocolate that you have that's cheaper. Yeah. Um, how do you square that? Well, truthfully, um, if we, one of the reasons that a lot of fair trade, whether it's fair trade clothing or chocolate or coffee or whoever, I, who knows? I have no idea, right? Whatever the product. One of the reasons that 
it's, it's more expensive because it's, it's, it's not mass produced in the same way. It's sourced more locally, right? And, in small, and produced in small portions. So when we produce in larger portions, obviously the cost goes down. So if we were generating fair trade produce across the board, and, and th then the cost would, would, would be very, not very different than, you know, th for example, the stream team, if you notice that some, the stream team often wears t-shirts right in here, right? So those are, f those are uh, fair trade t-shirts, right? So they, I got, so we bought those and they were $2 more. So it's like, all right, whatever, $2 more. Yeah, that's how I square it. Is, is that, does that answer your question? But like the, econo the economics of free, free trade across the board like prices go down. So Hershey's makes chocolate in Mexico and yeah. all over the world and it's cheaper on the whole than yeah. any other chocolate. So the economic incentive is to buy the cheaper chocolate regardless of who makes it and the circumstances from which it comes. Yeah, that's right. So that's a hard thing. What you have to do is educate people to say, hey, maybe I don't want to do this, right? Like, and then people start to make those decisions themselves because when you realize that it doesn't cost that much more, they, that someone actually can have a decent living, right? I can pay a quarter more for my cup of coffee. Most Americans, if they're, most I can speak of Americans, the vast majority of Americans who are familiar with the issues, whether they're conservative or liberal or whatever it is, Christians, non-Christians, most Americans who even have a small amount of familiarity with the issues will pay more. Not like double, but they will pay more. And we really see what it costs. 